Hello and welcome. Today's video is about bacterial growth and cell division. And all of this described in under 15 minutes. So let's start. In microbiology, cell division is highly connected to growth. And growth means an increase of cell number. Growth is a fundamental part of life, since after all, every cell has a limited lifespan and only by growth a population can remain. A bacterial cell is able to grow by doubling, so one cell doubles into two cells. These two cells double into four cells, into eight cells, into sixteen, and so on. Well, I think you understand the principle. Sounds easy, right? Nevertheless, the process of cell division is a highly complex mechanism, including over 2000 chemical reactions. Some of these chemical reactions are synthesizing different cofactors and coenzymes essential for the enzymatic reactions in cell division, while others deliver small molecules, which are acting as building blocks for bigger monomers. Then these monomers are chained together in a polymerization reaction to form more complex molecules with different properties. These accumulated polymers are able to form big cellular compounds like the cell wall and the cytoplasma membrane, but they can also build up flagellas, the translation units like ribosomes or other bigger enzyme complexes. The basic principle of cell division in bacteria looks like this. In general, a single cell is growing until it is divided into two cells. In an early step of cell division, the existing chromosome is replicated to ensure that every daughter cell gets a copy of the genetic material. During cell division, cells are often growing in size, like this rod-shaped E. coli bacterium you can see here. It is elongated until it reaches about twice the length of a single cell. At this point, a partition wall is formed, the so-called septum. The septum is a product of the newly synthesized cell wall and inner growth of the cytoplasma membrane. And after all, the septum is responsible for releasing the dividing daughter cells. While the genome is replicated very early during cell division, the separation of the chromosome copies is achieved at the later step of cell division. Precisely, when the septum between the dividing cells is formed. Besides the chromosome, every daughter cell gets the appropriate number of ribosomes and any other macromolecule the arising daughter cells need for their cellular life. The time a cell needs to divide is named generation time. And although all bacteria are doing cell division, their generation time can highly vary between different bacterial species. The best studied bacteria E. coli, for example, is one of the fastest dividing bacteria with a generation time of approximately 20 minutes. Although that's only true under perfect environmental conditions and mostly E. coli needs a little bit longer to divide. But anyway, E. coli is very fast when you compare the generation time to other bacteria. Other generation times can last for hours or even days. For example, the longest observed generation time can be found in Mycobacterium lepra, the pathogen of the lepra disease, with a generation time of 14 days. But let's get into more detail. How is cell division achieved? Essential proteins for cell division are the so-called FTS proteins. These kind of proteins are found in basically all bacteria. Moreover, they are also existing in many archaea, so the second prokaryotic domain of life. FTS proteins can also be found in chloroplasts or mitochondria of eukaryotic cells, showing the evolutionary connection of these organelles to bacteria. FTS stands for filamenting temperature sensitive. This goes back to the discovery of these proteins in the 1960s, where scientists observed that E. coli cells lacking these FTS genes failed to divide at higher temperatures and instead were growing as long filaments, unable to separate into two daughter cells. One key FTS protein is called FTSZ. Structurally, FTSZ shows many similarities to the eukaryotic tubulin, which is a major component of the eukaryotic cytoskeleton. 
During cell division, FTSZ moves to the division side and it is essential to recruit other proteins to build the dividing apertures named the divisome. In Roche bacteria, FTSZ locates itself in the middle of the cell. Here these proteins bind each other to form a ring of FTSZ proteins around the cell body. In E. coli around 10,000 of these FTSZ molecules are needed to encompass the cylindric cell. This ring later defines the site at which the cell division takes place. The initial step of cell division by FTSZ is also responsible to recruit other cell division proteins. One of them is FTSA, another FTS protein. FTSA is an ATP hydrolyzing enzyme and therefore delivers energy for cell division. Another protein is called ZIP-A, which anchors the FTSZ ring to the cytoplasma membrane. I told you before that during cell division new parts of the cell wall needs to be synthesized. Here the FTS protein FTSI plays an essential role by synthesizing peptidoglycan, which is a part of the cell wall. Lastly, we have FTSK, which is essential to separate both copies of the chromosome to the arising daughter cells. To ensure that DNA replication of the chromosome is complete, it is actually initiated even before the device is formed, and only when DNA replication is complete, the FTSZ ring is formed in the cell center. When the chromosome is fully replicated and the device is assembled, the septum is formed by depolarization of the FTSZ ring. So basically, the FTSZ ring constricts to separate the arising daughter cells. Since FTSZ has enzymatic activity, it delivers the responsible energy for this depolarization reaction by itself. To fully separate both cells, the proteins of the device ensure synthesis of new cytoplasma membrane, as well as building up new cell wall structures shown in green. The most important of them is of course peptidoglycan. Peptidoglycans are macromolecules out of sugar and amino acids, which are an essential part of the bacterial cell wall. Most gram-negative bacteria as well as gram-positive bacteria have this layer within their cell wall, although it's a little bit thinner in gram-negative bacteria due to differences in the cell wall structure. Nevertheless, peptidoglycan is a resilient layer which gives the cell wall its solidity. So new peptidoglycan is synthesized and integrated into the peptidoglycan layer. Which sounds easy is actually quite complex since you must consider that these cell wall parts must be integrated into the already existing peptidoglycan layer without affecting the structure of the cell. This essential step of cell division starts at the FTSZ ring. Here the so-called autolysins which are enzymes and part of the divisome, are forming small openings within the existing cell wall. After this, cell wall material is secreted through these openings and integrated into the peptidoglycan. As I already said, this process needs tight coordination, since failure can lead to autolysis and therefore cell death. So let's take a closer look at the peptidoglycan layer. Peptidoglycan consists of two strands of sugar derivates, which are connected via a glucosidic bond. The two sugar derivates are N-acetylglucosamine and N-acetylmuramine acid. They are forming linear chained molecules, which act as backbone of the peptidoglycan layer. From each N-acetylmuramine, a oligopeptide chain connects the sugar derivate with an N-acetylmuramine of the other strand. During growth to integrate new synthesized peptidoglycan precursor, it is necessary to systematically cut the existing peptidoglycan by autolysin. In the same reaction, peptidoglycan precursors are integrated into the peptidoglycan. A certain lipid carrier is of importance in this mechanism. It's called bactoprenol, which is basically a highly hydrophobic alcohol. Bactoprenol helps by transporting the peptidoglycan precursor over the cytoplasma membrane. After passing the cytoplasma membrane, bactoprenol moreover interacts with enzymes which are catalyzing the binding with other peptidoglycans. Last step of cell wall synthesis is the so-called transpeptidation reaction, 
That's basically the production of the cross connection between the muramine acids of the two peptidoglycan strains. By the way, this very point during bacterial growth is of importance in medicine, since this transpeptidation reaction is inhibited by the widely used antibiotic penicillin. But let's look a little bit closer what happens in this transpeptidation reaction. Since cell wall structures varies between different bacteria, also the transpeptidation varies. But in general, in the transpeptidation, a peptide connection between different amino acids is formed. In gram-negative bacteria like E. coli, usually the connection is formed between a D-aminopimylin acid or short DAP of one peptide and a D-alanine of the other peptide. During this, another D-alanine is cleaved during transpeptidation and with this delivers the appropriate energy for the connection. On the other hand, in gram-positive bacteria, the cross-connection usually is between a lysine and a D-alanine. By the way, it is widely considered that the FTS protein FTSI is the key protein during transpeptidation. So let's sum this up. Bacterial growth means an increase of cell number, in most cases achieved by doubling. Cell division and chromosome replication are tightly regulated, while FTS proteins are essential in this process. FTSZ defines the device inside by polymerizing to the FTSZ ring and later constricting to form the septum and dividing the two daughter cells. During growth, a new cell wall is formed by integrating peptidoglycans into the already existing glycan units. Peptidoglycan precursors are connected within the peptidoglycan layer via transpeptidation. And that's it, cell division described in under 15 minutes. If you liked the video and you want to support this channel, please feel free to click the subscribe button down below. Anyway, see you soon in the fantastic life of microbiology. Bye! Thank <laughs> you.